Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode number 98 of Tone the Slab, Pitching with David Cohn. We talk pitching each and every single week with the five-time World Series champ, the former Cy Young Award winner, David Cohn, the research master, James Smythe, myself, Justin Shackle, our excellent producer, Dan Rourke, is with us every step of the way as well. And this is going to be an episode with a lot of trade discussions with the deadline about two weeks away. A very exciting time of year for fans. But David, as a player, what is going through your mind coming to work every day, entering the clubhouse at this time of year? You know, this is the time of year where if you're in that position and you know that there's a good chance that you're going to be traded or at least you're going to be asked that question every single day, it's where being in a clubhouse can really help you. That sort of gallows humor kind of thing where everybody's getting on you, everybody's sort of making jokes about it and you know, I've heard that even uh, Phil Nevin with the Angels is joking with Otani, and Otani's giving it back to him, saying, "You only got me for two more weeks, and you're not going to be my manager anymore." And so that's the kind of thing that that brings levity to the whole situation when you're in a major league baseball clubhouse and everybody's together all those hours every day. That that kind of gallows humor really kind of gets you through it. And you look for ways to be funny about it. I think if you're an Angel fan, you are looking for any levity at the moment now because you truly do not know what is happening as this team uh, continues to lose some traction in the wild card standings. We're going to get to the Otani situation. It's the number one topic in the sport, but not just for his future, but also what he's been able to do and the track that he set himself on to potentially chased down Aaron Judge's AL home run record that was set just last season. So this is a historic uh, summer for Otani and for baseball, not just for what could be in his near future, but like I just said, for the record books as well. We'll talk Otani. We'll talk about how the Cardinals are open for business, where some of their key pitchers who make sense to be dealt, where they could end up. We'll look at some other pitchers who look to be on the trade block as well. And also, we mentioned the Cardinals just now. Which other underperforming team should be next in terms of putting up the white flag? We'll get into the Yankees discussion as well. A whole lot of uh, layers to peel back on that onion. So let's start here with the opener, David, a topic that is on your mind each and every week. Where do you want to begin? Well, the, the story of the industry, obviously, is Otani. So I guess I'll just frame the debate that we're going to have. And, uh, you know, I'm out here in Anaheim right now, right, in Laguna Beach, where the Yankees are staying. And, um, just to see what Otani's doing, the impact he has, not only on the baseball side of things, which we'll get into that argument, but there's another side of this argument. It's the business side. And, and certainly what he means to the Angels in terms of endorsements, in terms of revenue he brings in on uh, advertising. How does this thing, how's this thing going to play out? It's not your normal discussion with, hey, you know, you have to trade him, get back the best prospects you can get, and then maybe try to re-sign him. It's a little more complicated than that. And with each passing home run, with each sort of uh, historic achievement that he continues to accumulate, it makes that decision so much harder on both sides. His value keeps going up and the likelihood that he's going to get traded on the Angels side that they can actually pull the trigger trigger actually goes down in my mind. So that that's an interesting discussion. There's the baseball side and the business side. And, you know, I, I, I know how you guys feel about it, but it, it's a great discussion. It's dominating the industry and it, it deserves this attention. That's what makes it so fascinating, right? A unique situation for a unique player. You know, before we get into some some trade talk with Otani, and before I present, I guess, my first question for you guys, we're recording this the day after the series opener where the Angels beat the Yankees. James, I wanted to pick your brain on this. They obviously opt to pitch to Shohei Otani in the seventh inning. He hits a game-tying homer in the seventh He's leading off in the ninth inning in a tie game. How did you feel about how the Yankees approached Otani in that situation? Should they have, obviously he struck out against Nick Ramirez, but should the Yankees have pitched to him there or should they have gone after him like they did? They did? Because if you say, why are you pitching to Otani there in the seventh, then you shouldn't pitch to Otani in the ninth in a tie game. I'm wondering what, what you think. Well, I could see it either way, but I didn't have, a problem with them pitching to him in the seventh, maybe pitch around him a little, little bit. He's prone. He's more prone to strike out than a lot of superstars. He's prone to chase a little more. So if you do get ahead, maybe you get him to chase. I, I like what Michael King said after he said he got greedy when he was ahead one and two in the count, you go off the plate and see if he follows you there. 
But and it wasn't even that bad of a pitch, but 97 on the black, Otani can obliterate that pitch. So if you're gonna pitch to him, you got to do it a little carefully. I'm not a big fan of intentional walks in general. So if you fall behind two and oh, you say, okay, maybe don't don't give in here, and then you give him his base. But I didn't have a problem with them uh, pitching to him in general. David, what do you think? No, all, all valid points. I think, you know, the, if you look back in history, the only other comp would be Barry Bonds in, in, in his heyday when he was getting all those intentional walks, where Buck Walter walked him intentionally with the bases loaded in one particular game. I mean, the, the stories are legendary. And I think with the benefit of hindsight and analytics, advanced analytics, if Barry Bonds were playing in today's game, he'd have far fewer intentional walks. They'd play that much differently. The run expectancy with all of those intentional walks actually was worse than if you actually pitched to him and, and uh, compared that to his potential home run rate at the at that time in, in place. So with all that being said, I do think that Otani does chase. I do think that Michael King uh, saying he got a little greedy is a good way to say it. You have to be more careful in that situation. He He will chase. You should have gone out of the strike zone. You can't go in the strike zone to Otani, especially with a doubled up fastball especially a, a doubled up fastball away off a of fast a fastball inside that you beat him on. You actually beat him the previous pitch in the seventh inning I'm talking about. And you beat him on that inside fastball and then you go away with a fastball. That's a curious selection. I'm sure he would talk about it. I'll talk to him today at the ballpark. That's when you got to go down and out of the zone with something off speed, something moving to get him to chase the ninth inning. Well, it's hard to walk a leadoff guy in the ninth inning. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that that should have been done either. Uh, I give Ramirez a lot of credit. He threw an 89-mile-an-hour sinker right down the middle on the first pitch, and Otani, Otani swung at it so hard he had to call timeout. And then, look, he tweaked his back a little bit. And after the game, Nevin said, no, that's just Otani. He swings hard, and that's what he does. But it looked like his back was tweaked a little bit after those swings in the ninth inning. But I give Ramirez credit. He made a lot of good pitches, even though he gave up the game winner at the end. Uh, he went right after Otani with some guts. Yeah, I think he had the right approach for Otani. You saw him chase there. I I could, and I know, you know, analytics say otherwise, what you just said, David, about how if Barry Bonds was playing this day and age, he probably would have far fewer intentional walks. I think Otani's entered that stratosphere. You know, make Moniac beat you each and every time out. Uh, I, could, I could see if there's a sector of fans who believe that, who believe in putting the game-winning run on in the ninth inning. I just think that's where we're at with Shohei Otani uh, at the moment. And I also just think the approach in the seventh, it's another small example of the quality of play from, from the Yankees lately. But we, we'll get to that later on in the show. Let's focus on Otani right now. So before we get to the trade talk, he obviously hit a home run in Tuesday's game. Do you think Otani catches Aaron Judge's AL home run record this year? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go after James here. I'll let, I'll let James kind of frame this this debate here, and then I'll I'll chime in with mine. Well, I, I hate to to rain on the parade here, and as much as I love Otani, it it just doesn't seem it just seems so unlikely. Even on the pace that he's on right now, with thirty five home runs in ninety five team games, he's still only on pace for sixty. And at this time last year, Judge had one extra home run. He even heated up down the stretch for the Yankees last season. So it's a little boring to say, well, you know, he, he can't keep this up for 162 games the way he did for 95. I think he'll end up uh, with a pretty robust number on his own, maybe even, you know, a high mid to high fifties into maybe, maybe he could even challenge 60. I don't know, but I, I think he does not catch judge, but check it, check back with me in a month. Yeah, but the, the sizzling rate he's on right now suggests that there's going to be a little regression to the mean at some point here. I mean, he's hit 19 home runs in his last 31 games. I mean, how can you keep up that pace? That's just unreal. And to your point, Jack, maybe teams will start pitching around him more. Maybe it's going to be harder because he's not going to be allowed to see as many pitches to hit as, as we get down the stretch run and independent races in September. So that bear that in mind as well. But you know, when you think about Otani and you think about the fact that he's in this historic uh, chase right now, what does that do to the Angels' uh, thinking and, and in the process of trying to make this difficult decision of what to do that's in the best interest of the future of the Angels, but at the same time, 
This guy's bringing in enormous revenue in Anaheim right now as we speak. How do you weigh the enormous revenue that's coming in for the next, you know, two and a half months versus what the next seven, eight years for your franchise? That's probably the big question that Artie Moreno asks himself when he when he goes to bed each night. Like how uh, how is the premise of hey not wanting to be the person that trades away Shohei Otani? And I know David, you're not alone in posing you know this thought is not wanting to be the guy that deals Otani away, is that the most practical business approach to handling your organization's future if you're the team owner here? Well, to me, you have to separate out the business side of it and the baseball side of it. So to your point, Shaq, the baseball side of it suggests get the best offer you can and then take your chances in the offseason to try to sell him on coming back. You know, uh, similar to what Brian Cashman did with Aroldis Chapman years ago. You know, that kind of a trade him away, uh, get Glaber Torres, and then sign him back. You know, that kind of scenario. So, yeah, baseball, that makes sense. Business, a whole different story. You know, I talked to Mark Langston, you know, the former Angels pitcher who covers the Angels, and he said after every Angels game right now, the lines are around the block to buy Otani jerseys after every single home game. He walks out to get to his car after the game, after covering the game, and they keep that shop open for at least two hours after the Angels game. It is just remarkable. They're buying jerseys off the rack just at an incredible rate. The advertising around the ballpark, if you see uh, the, all the Japanese companies that advertise with the Angels. Now, when you think even further, when you think about, okay, what about television ratings? What about if he does get in a historic home run chase down the stretch run? There were estimates that Aaron Judge was worth $100 million to the Yankees last year just in the last couple of months because of the ratings that he generated with that historic home run chase. So from the business side, there is a projection you can make. If we keep Otani the rest of the year and he does have a historic home run chase and, and we sneak into the playoffs and all of a sudden Otani's on center stage and he falls back in love with the Angels again and maybe they even uh, catch lightning in a bottle, that might be your best way forward. Take the revenue, try to go for the long shot of getting into the postseason. That's your best chance to sign him back because ultimately that's the best move for the Angels is keep him, sign him back. And then if you do lose him, you've got all that revenue you generated down the stretch run and you do get two draft picks. So you weigh that against, well, who could we get back? What are the offers for Otani as a rental? Who could we get back, really? And what is what kind of assurances do we have that that's going to make a mark on our organization moving forward? The, I mean, mentioned before about how unique of a player he is. That's what makes this situation so odd as far as trying to gauge what it would actually take to get him. If you have, you know, a, a big bat at the deadline or or, a, or an ace pitcher, or a top reliever, you kind of get an idea. Okay, well, here's a similar trade that happened last year, three years ago, and this is what they gave up to get him. Otani's such an unusual player, and the idea that he's just a rental, as great as he is, you're getting hopefully eight starts down the stretch with him on the mound, and then you put him in the middle of your lineup too. But there's no real precedent to try and get an, uh, your your hands around. Well, what would it actually even take? How many of your top prospects? Would it be your number one prospect and a few other guys? Would it be your top three? Who knows? The, the thing that I keep going back and forth on, but I'm kind of leaning toward what I'm about to say here, David. Like I hear you, like the you know, the revenue that you're creating over the next two and a half months, the draft picks that you get if he does end up leaving, like that's that's your consolation. To me, that does not outweigh the potential package of young assets that you could receive in a deal at the deadline, which in turn could entice Shohei Otani to re-sign with you in the offseason, especially if the pool is limited here to only West Coast teams. Obviously, we don't know that for sure, but that's the vibe we continue to get here. And it kind of leads me to my next question. Like, if you are not on the West Coast here and it's trade season and – I think, you know, if you're not on the West Coast, but you also have the capacity to sign Otani to a long-term deal. There are only a handful of those teams, Yankees, Mets, Braves, Red Sox. Does your best chance at signing Shohei Otani long-term actually rest on trading for him right now? 
it's a valid point. Anybody know, anybody can guess rather right now because Shohei Otani plays it so close to the vest. There's such a mystique and a mystery about him. Um, you know, he doesn't hardly ever even take BP on the field, much less, you know, reveal what he's thinking. You know, if you, you think back when the Angels came to Yankee Stadium earlier this year, he took one round of BP on the field, eight swings. And he looked at Phil Nevin in the cage and he asked him, where does Giancarlo Stanton hit him? Where does Aaron Judge hit him? And Nevin pointed up above center field near the scoreboard. And Otani took aim and hit him over there. Like three or four home runs he hit in batting practice in one round, shooting for those marks. That's how this guy thinks. So it, who knows? Yeah, it's a valid point, Jack. And that's why this is such a great debate. There are no wrong answers. We don't know what the offers are going to be. Obviously, the Angels are going to have to field those offers. Do you give up your top two or three or four prospects in your organization for a two-month rental with no guarantees? Maybe you do You do go out on that limb to try to entice him to sign with you. I mean, these are all valid points, valid questions. But the one thing we know for sure is that we don't know for sure. <laughs> and you know, Only Otani knows. And maybe he's flexible, too. Maybe he's thinking it through. Six years ago, he wanted to be on the West Coast. Maybe he's a little more open now to going to the East Coast. Who knows? You know, that, that that's an old thought. You know, Otani wanted to be on the West Coast. He turned down the Yankees. He doesn't want to be on the East Coast. He's a West Coast guy. That was a six-year-old decision now at this point. Who knows what he's thinking now? So it, anything is possible. And I like that idea of, you know, shooting your shot, making, getting your, you know, your one negotiating window, even if it's not truly a negotiating window, this is your one chance to sell yourself to him before anyone else. And the other aspect of this that I am intrigued by is, well, what about non-traditional free agent uh, fishermen, you know, teams that might not normally be going for a big free agent, but might on a rental basis, the Orioles. They are not going to have any chance to get Shohei Otani long term, but you're also swimming in prospects. You can give up a few of your big guys and still have a ton left over. And that's something where you say, OK, well, we can't we're not going to give him a hundreds of millions of dollars contract. But if we pick up the you know 10 or 12 million that's left on his deal and we can swing this trade, we could swing the American League playoff picture and it's a way to kind of cash things in with your fan base too. So I think the idea of him being a rental, the unique situation that he has, it there's so many possibilities that'll make the next couple of weeks here before the deadline so fascinating. I think that that could be the most exciting scenario right there, James. The the teams that you know are not going to sign him to a long-term deal that have the assets to trade for him and make the most of the season that they've been having. Orioles, the Rays, the Reds. I mean, they all have the prospect capital to to make a move here. How exciting would that be? Like, like one, you're a fan in Cincinnati going to Great American Ballpark for Ellie De La Cruz. Then you got Shohei Otani on top of that in Cincinnati, something that we couldn't even have fathomed in April in spring training. The Rays, yes, they're consistent, but are they gonna get ever gonna get that top of the line big money free agent? No. This is as good of a year as any to take that shot and try and get that championship that you've been working so hard for the Orioles, the same thing, trust the process and and the full rebuild. Well, it's smacking you right in the face right now. You have something that could be very special in Baltimore this year. If you make a move like this. So every, all those types of teams, they're having terrific years, throw the diamondbacks in there as well. You're having terrific years. You're having promising years. You can push it across and make yourself a true title contender with that one simple move. I shouldn't say simple because you're going to be giving up a lot of promising pieces, but uh, it, it could cap, it could help you capitalize on what's been a very memorable 2023 season so far. People, more Tone of the Slab is coming up, but first I need to tell you about how you can hit it out of the park this baseball season with DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers can place a $5 bet and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Plus, all customers can take a shot at bigger payouts with DraftKings stepped-up same-game parlays. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app, sign up with code SLAB, that's S-L-A-B, and new customers can bet just 5 bucks and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code SLAB only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Massachusetts, call 800 327 Five zero five zero, or visit gamblinghelplinema.org. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 
in Kansas. Call 1-800-522-4700. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 or plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Opt in and 10 plus leg requirement for 100% boost. Eligibility, wagering, and deposit restrictions apply. Terms at sportsbook.draftkings.com slash baseball terms. It has not been memorable for the St. Louis Cardinals. Stuck in last place in the NL Central. We've heard John Mazalock multiple times now get in front of microphones talking about the team strategy at the trade deadline. They are open for business. If you just focus in on some of the pitchers that figure to be going to other places before the trade deadline, the Jack Flaherty's, the Jordan Montgomery's, Jordan Hicks as well. Where do some of these trade chips for St. Louis, where do they fit best? Well, it's what a great time of year to speculate on some of these and who are pretenders and contenders and who can get back in it the next couple of weeks or who thinks they are. And it's really July 30th with expanded, with the expanded playoff format, enough information for organizations, right? I mean, we saw Philly get in with 86 wins last year. What's the number? What's the magic number to get that last wild card spot? Is it worth it? So with all that being said, I will say this. I'll say, um, you know, the Atlanta Braves are, are, I think, by and large, everybody's consensus, best team of baseball going right now. But they could use a really good starting pitcher. And there's one out there if they could pry him away, and that's Dylan Cease from the Chicago White Sox. If I'm the Atlanta Braves, I'm going hard. After Dylan sees, he fits right in behind Spencer Strider, swing and miss guy. Max Fried's coming back. You want to win the World Series? You've got all these guys around for all these years. The majority of their nucleus of players are around for the next six, seven, eight, nine years, signed to long-term deals. Dylan Cease is from the Atlanta, Georgia area. If I'm them, that's the guy I'm going for really hard right now. Not a bad pick. As far as teams that are that are going to be in the mix, like everybody needs pitching, right? But mm-hmm. I mentioned the Orioles before. It seems like they need a starter or even two behind guys like Tyler Wells and Kyle Bradish. They could use an upgrade there in not just a wild card race, but all of a sudden the American League East has a tight division race at the top between Baltimore and Tampa Bay. How real is Arizona? The, the Astros need to get their pitchers healthy. They could use an arm. The Rays behind McClanahan, he's back. Glass now coming back. Zach Eflin is a good pickup, but even the teams that are really strong, Coney, the Braves, the the team with the least to complain about in all of Major League Baseball, even they could use an arm this time of year. It just goes to show, can't have too much pitching. I see like three teams, the Braves, the Rays, the Orioles, three teams having incredible seasons. And I think when you you talk about clubs leaving no doubt at the trade deadline, fortifying your team as much as possible. The Braves have champagne problems right now. I think those are the three types of teams that are going to be in it for the top tier pitchers at the deadline. So you mentioned Dylan Cease. I'll throw in uh, I'll throw in Lucas Giolito as well into that equation. I know Jack Flaherty has the track record. He hasn't had the best season, though he's looked better his last three or four starts. So, I, I you know, I, I see the Ceases and the Giolitos the the Flaherty's going to teams like the Rays and the Braves who are monsters and are only looking to get stronger. So maybe there's some secondary pieces as well, like a Jordan Montgomery from the Cardinals, you know, a sh- prototypical number three starter. I see the like the Astros all over him. Maybe the Phillies side him back of Nola and Wheeler there. And then you have the bullpen pieces. You talk about Philadelphia last year. Jordan Hicks would look pretty good setting up Craig Kimbrell in that bullpen. Josh Hader's there as well, and that could get me to uh, to our next talking point here. The Cardinals have already waved the right white flag. Which other underperforming team do you think should be next? Eesh, you know, I, you know, we didn't mention Marcus Stroman either, who's probably going to be available as well. Yeah. And I, you know, and the, the San Francisco Giants are are hot. You know, they're on a win streak. They're suddenly in it. I think Strowman would fit great in San Francisco, but Giants, as far as, Blue Jays, maybe going yes, back to Toronto. Exactly. So Strowman's another big arm out yeah. there. Cease and Strowman is guys. You can slide into a number two or three starter in postseason. You're looking at lining up your postseason uh, rotation there. So that that's why I focused on those guys. Uh, uh, 
I still get back to, you know, it's July 30th. You know, is that enough information for some of these teams that are hovering around 500? Who should, who should raise the white flag? Who, you know, how do you make that determination at that point in the season when, when you know you have the expanded playoff, uh, the format, but boy, you know, that, that's a tricky one. I mean, if you're looking, you know, even Boston might be in it now. Boston's looking for a, a starter at the end. So you, you're thinking, man, who's in and who's out? You know, boy, it's, you know you're going to look at St. Louis because they've already declared themselves and there's some pieces there. It might be a matchup there too, as far as the Cardinals with the Yankees. So uh, as far as outfielders go. So it's really about matchups, who's in and who's out. It's really difficult now though, to, to sort of make that determination. And, you know, I'll defer, I'll defer to James. Maybe you can spark this up a little bit. No, I, I mean, honestly, I kind of can't because, I don't really know. Now, the Cardinals, obviously, they've had such a disappointing season, and they're really out of it. But beyond that, I don't know who would wave the white flag. You start looking at you look at projections. You look at the standings. You say, well, what's it really going to take? Coney, you asked, what's the magic number? Last year, it was 86. Well, you look at fan graphs and their playoff odds. They have the American League last wild card at 90 wins. Pakoda has it at 87. That's a big difference. On the National League side, fan graphs has it 86, 87 wins. Dakota 87. So if you, even a team like the Padres, where just when you think they're going to go on a little bit of a run here, they lose three in a row. But at the same time, they're eight games out. That's a huge deficit. However, Philly's hot. Arizona and Miami are coming back to the pack. Is the NL Central good enough to get two playoff teams in? So you might not have to, you might be able to jump some of these teams that you need to jump. So San Diego, even though they're eight games out, they only need to jump three teams. And Miami's been out over their skis a little bit all year with their record in one-run games. Arizona got off to that great start. They're starting to slip back a little bit. Cincinnati and Milwaukee, they might have a softer schedule down the stretch, but I don't know if they're going to be able to keep up in the in a wild-card race as opposed to the division. So even a team like San Diego might just say, you know what, we have these guys, Some not just for this year, we can give it another push. The one, the one wild card team here, and we don't know because it's a new owner, relatively new owner. It's the Mets. You know, what are the Mets really going to do with all those assets? Is Max Scherzer really going to be made available? Uh, Starling Marte, an outfielder who's under underachieved this year, but is immensely talented. Uh, the Cubs got to be the team. They have two tremendous assets in Stroman and Bellinger. Bellinger look good in pinstripes too. If you're a Yankee fan, so. He's highly coveted. He's hot, pitching well. Stroman, you know, you're looking at a guy that goes seven innings. He can, he can give you real depth and rotation. That is a real commodity, too. So the Cubs should be the obvious choice to answer your question, Shaq. The wild card's got to be the Mets. I, You know what, James? Uh, I, You're starting to sway me in this other direction because I was going to say the Padres, and I think half the argument there is that a lot of these teams that are in front of them right now – they could realistically regress in the standings. So it's fewer and fewer clubs that you kind of have to jump over. But when you take a look at projections, like the lowest number, 87, do we do we really believe like the Padres have, what, 43 wins in them over the last two and a half months? I feel like more of their problems rest internally within their clubhouse. So it's, it's a team that's never really gelled. Is that going to happen to the extent of 43 wins over the next two and a half months, that's why, for me, if I'm, you know, AJ Preller, you know what's going on in there. You know what's happening internally. Are you going to bet on that for the next two and a half months? Or are you going to unload some of the assets that you have and retool here? But the one thing we have is time. We still have some more time. The Padres, you look at their schedule. They have a, a series with the Blue Jays in Toronto this week. Then it's Tigers, Pirates. The Rangers, they're tough, of course. Rockies, Dodgers, and then and then that's when the, the trade deadline is coming around. So you have some softer teams. If you actually do go on a little bit of a run, say you go, oh, let's see, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. Say you, you go on a little 10 and 5 and 11 and 4 here, and you say, okay, now we're back in it. If you're still floundering around and you're still eight games out, then you can kind of reassess things. But right now, you still have time on your side. The business side of things, too. We, we're going to find something out. We know Peter Seidler in San Diego is an incredible owner, really going for it. He's lit up his fan base. 
recent moves all the way back to Soto from last year. But the regional sports network has been taken over by Major League Baseball. They're getting paid 80 percent of their their local revenue contract reportedly. Uh, you know, I mean, let me qu- qualify that by saying reportedly. But there's no the, the Arizona Diamondbacks local revenue and their regional sports network has been taken over now recently by major league baseball. So we're going to find out how that impacts San Diego moving forward. So I, Peter Seidler is very committed. He still says he's a buyer. They're going to stay in it. You know, the, the mindset of the owner, including Artie Moreno with the angels really plays into this. So what you should do and what the owners are going to do are two different things, but we're going to find out how big of a deal, at least right now in, in the immediate future that this bankruptcy is, is going to have on impacting these the, the local revenue of the Padres, the Diamondbacks, and then moving forward, more to come potentially. That's a really good point, David. Uh, that, that could be on the doorstep of some of these teams, like we said, in the next two weeks, how they go about the rest of their seasons. It's been a story that's that's been there all year, but it could actually affect now the team on the field, uh, this trade deadline. Very good point. You mentioned, James, uh, time being on the Padres' side, still ahead of the trade deadline. Kind of transitions into our Yankee talk because a lot of people look at this July schedule for the Yankees. This team is currently in a stretch where they have played Oakland, St. Louis, had a four-game series with the Orioles, but also the Cubs, the Rockies, now the Angels. They have the Royals and the Mets up next. At this moment, they've gone 7 and 10 in this stretch so far. This was supposed to be their chance to get fat in the win column. And if you look ahead to their schedule, it is never going to be easier the rest of the season. So how perilous is the Yankee season at the moment, guys? Yeah, it's it's tough when you're, you're trying to get to the trade deadline and augment your roster with somebody like a Cody Bellinger or a left fielder or you know, whatever they, they can find and you're limping there, like, boy, how do you, and then at the end of the month, you're looking at facing the Orioles in the Rays going into the first week of, of, of August. So and then it, Houston. Yes. And then Houston after that. So that, it's wow. It's precarious right now without, there's no two ways about it. Um, the Yankees need to find a way to jumpstart their offense. It's not just about Aaron judge. Certainly they're hopeful that he'll be back fairly soon. Apparently uh, maybe even for the Mets you know, uh, series at Yankee Stadium. So it remains to be seen, but it's not just about Aaron Judge. You know, It's about the rest of the guys that have underachieved, and maybe they need another move within. You know, uh, Oswald Peraza was a nice lift last night. He really showed up, had great at-bats, um, you know, gives them youthful energy, gives them speed, gives them a guy who can uh, – light up a clubhouse. You know, there's nothing better for, for an aging clubhouse or for a veteran clubhouse to have a, a youthful injection of energy. And, and Peraza has presented that. Uh, is there somebody else in the organization that can do that? Will the Yankees pull the trigger? They've been very reluctant to, to make those moves and call up some of their top prospects. Uh, they, they really uh, keep them in a pecking order. I mean, does a guy like an Austin Wells get a look? you know, a catcher, even though he's in double A, a left-handed batter, do they want to upgrade? They talked about rumors of upgrading the catcher position in terms of offense. Um, you know, do, do, they, do you try to do it within and to give your team a jump start? And, you know, it's interesting to think about and do. Sounds like a long shot, but that's where the Yankees are right now. You need, you need the jump start to get you to the trade deadline. And, you know, Peraz is that guy right now. Is there somebody else down there that can do that as well? How perilous is the season at the moment? Not very right now, but they need to turn it around right now. Things can turn on a dime. So they've lost seven out of nine. Before this stretch, things were still going pretty well, even without Aaron Judge, and they were stepping back a little bit because they were still a couple games clear for a playoff spot in the second wild card, not the third. They had won seven out of ten. They just won a couple big games against the Orioles. Their playoff odds were 75% and say, okay, they can, they can weather the storm here. You go two and seven against mostly underperforming teams. All of a sudden you're out of a playoff spot. You're two and a half games back of the last wild card and your playoff odds in just about nine games, just uh, pretty much got cut in half. So that's bad. However, all it takes is one stretch the other way to flip this thing around. You went two and seven, you still have, Two more games in this Angels series. You have three games against the Royals. 
two games against the Mets. You can get on a little run here, win a couple series, and then take that into the trade deadline, Baltimore, Tampa, Houston. And, and by then, hopefully you have Aaron Judge back, who is obviously the big driver of this offense. I want to hear what Dan Rourke has to say as the, the mouth of the fans here. But James, like I, I, I hear that and I agree with that. Like the team has the talent to do that. And what you say is real. What Aaron Boone continues to say is real that his team has, you know, two and a half months to prove that it's championship caliber, it's a postseason team, whatever you want to call it. It's accurate. Those statements that he makes are accurate. His message within the clubhouse uh may be different and may call for more urgency than what he does say in some of these media sessions that we see. The thing I'm hung up on though is that all we have to go off of is what we are presently seeing. And what we've already seen in 2023, and there are a lot of examples on a nearly daily basis where the quality of play puzzles you. So, yeah, the lack of wins in this specific stretch causing frustration, I'm sure, for fans like Dan. But the the quality of play, I think, is what needs fixing here. And I think that can be rectified. That's where time isn't on their side, in my opinion. Like, they have the rest of the schedule to get shaped up here and tighten up, but we have not seen that yet. That's a little puzzling to me. Dan, what do you think here as the fan who's watching this stretch where they've gone 7 and 10 against teams that are mostly sub-500 ball clubs? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think at the end about the time, I think you say it perfectly. I mean, they have enough time, but are they good enough to do something with that time? And something that I'm at now as a fan and I, you know, I lean pretty optimistic. So it's, I usually avoid opinions like this, but by now I think I can just say, I don't think the players are good enough. I just don't think they are now. Are they maybe a solid team entering last night? They were 83 and 79. So they're above average. Sure. But as for a championship caliber operation, I just, I, I don't see it. And who does that fall on to me? That falls on Brian Cashman. And I'm not just some fan who, you know, something goes wrong instantly blame the GM. Cause that's an easy take to have. I usually don't go that route, but at this point, I mean, I can't necessarily blame Boone, who not saying I'm I'm in love with him, but I also I don't think majority of this is on him. Hal Steinbrenner, you give somebody two hundred eighty million dollar payroll, you should be able to construct a roster that even without Aaron Judge, who yes makes a big difference, they shouldn't be this bad. And I am where I'm at now with Brian Cashman is I know he just got a four year extension, but he has to pull off the best trade di- deadline of all time, in my opinion, to get this to be a team that you advertise as a championship caliber operation. Cause right now they just, they just aren't that. I mean, you have, do we have, who has an on base percentage above 300? Glaber Torres. I mean, Anthony Rizzo is going to be there too much longer and he's starting to actually become a concern. I mean, I love Rizzo. I love him to death, but like at what point is, do you actually have to com- have a conversation of, is he just not that guy anymore? Was it the Tatis thing that, that messed him up? I don't know, but Finally, now there's starting to be enough concerns where I don't know if this team's going to make the playoffs. I really don't. There's a lot of time left where they could write the ship and you do have the trade deadline. So maybe Brian Cash could work, work out some deals that'll help this team. And I think he will. He, he always makes moves just a matter if they work out or not. But right now, what I'm currently watching, and even with Aaron Judge back, this is not a championship caliber operation. Judge comes back next week. I think they might still make the playoffs. But for the first time, I am. I have a little bit of doubt. I really do, which is weird. Shouldn't be the case, man. I mean... Just six years ago, dude, I think back to ALCS Game 7 and what the future was going to look like. I remember saying I I thought the Dark Ages were so – it was so funny. Yankees' Dark Ages was like an 85-win season to me, flirting with the playoffs to the end. Like, oh, that was our Dark Ages, and now we got a nice young core. ALCS already, we're going to have a big future. And since then, I mean, in the Garrett Cole era, we haven't won one ALCS game, which is just unfathomable to me. So – It's weird where this team's at, man, and it is very disappointing as a fan, and I can't exactly put my optimistic spin on it today. But I'll be watching tonight at 940. No, I'll be there. I'm going down with the ship. (laughs) I'm always going to go down with the ship, but it has been very, very tough lately. If if you're not watching the YouTube stream here, I mean, this, guys, we we really have Dan Rourke in his therapy session. He's sitting on his couch, kind of looking out into the sun out the window reflecting yeah. uh this is this is true therapy right here for Dan. i'm sweating <laughs> coming off a night of ac where i should have been enjoying myself i was up a couple hundred bucks and then otani ties the game all went downhill from there for the yankees and my wallet so that's where i'm at right now crushing uh but yeah like like you said 
Ryan Cashman has the ability. You, you should have the faith for him to, to be able to make the moves that could potentially start to fix this team on the fly. Like last year, look, I know they resulted in some injuries and the moves didn't work out, but at the time the trades were made, they looked very sharp, very promising. Then the injuries happened. Like the, by design, the moves that were made, they looked like the right moves. You can't factor in the in in injuries. You can't predict those injuries, but... I called him cash god after those moves. I will say it. I, I said cash yeah. god after the deadline last year. Just sometimes doesn't work out. Right. People were very happy with the with the deadline when those trades were made. You know, totally. Juan Soto was not a realistic option, and neither was Luis Castillo. So they pivoted to the next best realistic options. And the consensus at the deadline was that the Yankees did pretty well for themselves at the time. Right, and you could see how they fit in in terms of making the team better. So. I, I, you know, you, you can't, you can't be crushing Cashman for those deadline moves because at the time, like you said, James, the consensus was that they were the right moves at the time. That's really all you can, you can go off of in a realistic look uh, at, at the trade deadline and, and the track record there. But um, when, when looking at what's ahead here, how they could also pivot something that I see a few Yankee fans talk about, David, I want, I want to hear what you think about this because so many Yankee fans, I think they say, oh, the Yankees are stuck in their ways. Their process is what it is. They do not pivot from the process. Well, I don't think they projected themselves to be, at this moment, moving toward late July, toward the trade deadline, uh, out of a playoff spot at the moment, just five games above 500, and having to leapfrog a lot of teams that look pretty promising down the stretch. And they have a hardened approach to how they use their bullpen here. So... With October perhaps not a lock at the moment, can the Yankees afford to not adjust their bullpen rules at this present time? Pitchers working three days in a row, if needed in a certain spot. The the various uh up, you know, up one day, down the off day, down on an off day, off on, off on, all the rules that they have set in place for each specific relievers. Do they kind of have to loosen those rules a bit here? It's a valid question. Um, I think that's an organizational decision that everybody has a hand in. Uh, they have medical experts, their analytics department, load management issues that they, they adhere to. Is there going to be specific games leading up over the next couple of weeks to the trade deadline in order to where he's going to have to push and take a chance? Yeah, absolutely. Brian Cashman uses the term declare themselves. This team needs to declare themselves. And you've got two weeks to declare yourselves. And if you, you know, as James Smythe said, you can easily turn around and go seven and two over the next uh, couple of weeks and just get yourself right back to 10 games over 500 and right into the mix. But if it goes the other way and you fall down closer to 500 or five games over now, I guess, right, somewhere in that range, um, well, this is a precarious position to be in. You can go either way right here, trying to get off this West Coast trip and then obviously you go home and you play the Royals. But with all that being said, they need to declare themselves. Who are they? And in last night's game, you're playing two infielders in the outfield. Now, I love Isaiah Kiner Falefa and I love Oswaldo Cabrera. Great guys, but they're infielders. You know, and yeah, they play pretty they play pretty decent outfield. You know, they've converted and yeah, they're 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 definitely guys that that have handled themselves well out there. But where are the outfielders? Where are they in your organization? Where are the true outfielders? Are you gonna get uh, an outfielder at the trade deadline? If you don't declare yourself over the next uh, couple of weeks, does that change everything? Do all of a sudden, do, does Cashman pivot and go, you know what? Now I've got to look into next year. Maybe I got to look into, is there some interest in Glaber Torres? Do I need to reshuffle things? Is anything on the table at this point? What does the future look like? I mean, that's where the Yankees are right now. So in a long-winded roundabout way to answer your question, Jack, if I'm Aaron Boone, I'm going, yeah. I need to win some games here, you know, before the trade deadline, because this team needs to, to declare themselves as legitimate contenders. Well, I do think we we saw a little bit of that in the opening game in Anaheim. Clay Holmes was warming up for a potential save in, in the Angels game. And that was because, yes, it would be three days in a row, but he only threw 11 pitches in game one, eight pitches in game two. And People are very used to following their own team. And a lot of the things that are viewed as rigid rules in Yankeedom are really just around Major League Baseball. 
the amount of times that you see a reliever pitch three days in a row has almost disappeared. And then the, the next step is, well, pitch. it's not just three days in a row. It's trying to avoid pitching four times in five days. That has also almost disappeared. So a lot of the things that are viewed as just a Yankee thing are really is really an everybody thing. And part of the reason why you do that is, well, one, you want to avoid wearing these guys out early in the season, because if you start pitching guys three days in a row and four out of five more and more, then they're more likely to get hurt. They're more likely to get worn down and be bad. And part of the reason why someone like a Clay Holmes has been so great all season is because they've been managing pretty well. And even Michael King, who's slumping now, but coming off the injury, they had a pretty unique uh, one-off situation with him where he would pitch multiple innings and then be down for a couple of days. Maybe as you know the season goes on, he could, if you need him to have a shorter outing with less rest, maybe you do that. But I think they are, they have loosened things up a little bit and you want to be careful there because you don't want to risk burning out. There, a, lot, a lot of times with the, some of these this bullpen usage, over the course of a season, fans worry you're going to get the bullpen worn down. Well, part of the reason why you haven't had these guys wear down is because you've been avoiding using them three days in a row. Yeah, you have to credit the way the Yankees have managed the bullpen up to this point. You've, you've, there, there are so many times in the box scores that you see a guy like Wandy Peralta or a guy like Clay Holmes. You take a look at their pitch total, and each night it's fewer than ten pitches, and yet they're making, they're getting the the bigger outs late in the game in certain situations so you absolutely have to tip your your cap to that you just wonder based on where the team is now the bullpen is its strongest department despite some of the recent struggles you know do they have to bend the rules a little bit here do you have to not completely you know rip the caution sticker off the mattress but do you have to do you have to bend and be a little bit more flexible it's an interesting time leading up to the trade deadline and also an interesting time period before Aaron Judge gets back. Do those two overlap? I'm going to have to wait and see here. Uh, David, what do you have for us this weekend on Sunday Night Baseball? Where are you going to be? Uh, it's going to be um, – we are um, uh, back in New York. I think it's um, – Mets uh, Sox, right? Yeah, it's a uh, Mets Sox, yeah. Okay. Mets in Boston. Yep. In Boston at Fenway Park. Very nice. Very nice. So back on the East Coast for you. Well, in soak up all that Southern California sun in the meantime, my friend. Um, yes. Watch, you know, keep an eye out on Dave, uh, for David during the rest of this Yankees Angels series and on Sunday Night Baseball. Mets and Red Sox. Yankees out on the West Coast finishing up a road trip out there before coming back home. Less than about two weeks to go before the trade deadline. Exciting times here in the big leagues that's going to do it for us for this episode please subscribe to our youtube channel so you do not miss what we're putting out each and every week that's going to do it for david Cohn, for james Smythe, for our terrific producer dan work and we have a chance to perhaps win big next week my friend these are just the lulls that you have to go through uh as a as a young pup coming up into the game we all go through it don't worry your, your pocket will get heavier as time goes on i'm justin shackle we'll talk to you next week on tone the slab pitching with david Cohn, a production of shamboy media take care everybody